Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the first, the inaugural issue of Making Sense Online, which will be a short term, at least a twice weekly, for lack of a better word, podcast around what's happening in educational technology news and how that might impact particularly what teachers are doing in classroom and in classroom environments. Uh, for the kickoff session here and throughout our trials and tribulations, uh, we'll bring in a series of guests and individuals that have an interest in a number of the topic areas that relate to these kinds of elements. And most of that discussion will happen with a good friend and colleague, Dave Cormier. Dave, why don't you do a quick hello and tell people who you are and why you're delightful. <laughs> so uh, my name's Dave Cormier. I'm in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. I do digital learning strategy at the University of Windsor. And uh, I'm delightful because George says so. That's pretty much uh, the way that this works. Uh, for me, this is going to be a really helpful way of keeping track of all of the things and sort of focusing on the things that are coming across. I think one of the big challenges that I'm having right now, and certainly other people I've spoken to, is that you get to the point where there's so much information coming in that you never get a chance to process any of it. And so this will be, at least for me, a way of participating and processing a discussion that's really important both to my own practice and to the work that I'm trying to get done to support my institution and the open resources I'm contributing to as well. So I'm really excited to uh, see what we can get done. Awesome, great, thanks Dave. So to give everyone a little bit of a sense of what we're gonna do here, as a general rule, we're going to try and track on Tuesdays and Thursdays at this time, 4 p.m. Texas in this particular Zoom room, but uh, many of you may just access the audio recording after the fact once we get it up on, on uh, podcast uh, sites for, for you to access if you're big into listening to podcasts while you walk, run, or stay at home in isolation. The way this works is some of you may be here as part of the pivoting online course that we're running on edX and that course right now we're on week one we're looking at how to quickly get started and what that might mean to you and we want to provide a scientific or a research oriented lens by the same account this serves that particular course but these 30 minute sessions are intended to outlive that as well as long as we're dealing with a range of significant changes impacting higher education so that's roughly the approach and roughly the value of this we're trying to focus on people who are staff or teachers, professors who are in different academic settings who are dealing with this very quick change that is forcing sort of a refocus and a rethinking of how you do teaching and learning. And so that's really the intent of it. And I think if, uh, if you all are good to go, we're just going to dive right in and start looking at a, a few different resources, news, and outputs that have happened since, well, we last met and discussed. And we're going to drop in links in the forum here, and we'll also post them online as we host it later on. If you have any questions or thoughts, feel free to just type them in. We're happy to engage with you for those of you that are in the actual Zoom in space. And if you have links or something that you think is of interest, that would be great to share as well. Before I dive in though, Dave, why don't we just start with a quick overview of what is going on around the world that you're seeing? Uh, you wanna talk about it from a Canadian perspective? I was just reading the University of Alberta is getting massive cuts that were actually predating the current COVID crisis, but whereas some governments are ramping up funding, the government of Alberta has decided no we are still going to cut positions. The University of Alberta now says they're looking at around a thousand positions over the next year and a half, two years in terms of that budget cycle that will be cut. What are you seeing in Canada as a whole? So, I mean, the Canadian context is always a bit weird because we're, uh, Canadian education is provincial. So we've got Alberta and Ontario that are very much trying to cut back on the money that's going out to institutions, or at least restructure that they may call it, uh, depending on how you look at it. And we've got other provinces that are putting more money into higher education. So we're always kind of sliding back and forth. All of those rules changed about a week ago. Basically, a week and a half ago, most of the universities in Canada decided to go online. So uh, we've got some pretty deep implications, right? So we have, uh, you know, on average, somewhere in the 20% international students, um, which has done an awful lot to support and underwrite financials inside of higher ed. So we've got that concern. Uh, if those students aren't coming in September, we've got some serious problems in terms of our bottom line. Uh, but more specifically, right in front of us right now, on our cycle here in Canada, our, um, most of the examinations are coming out in about two weeks. So we've had this, this pivot online thing that's happened here and in the States, not necessarily the same way in some other countries, depending on the time frame. But we're moving extraordinarily quickly to get from here to there. We have, and, and actually common to a lot of universities in Canada, suspended our Senate regulations around how grading works which has allowed for more flexibility, but that flexibility is going into a, an area that the people who now have that flexibility don't have a history of expertise 
with regards to specifically putting their stuff online. So they can change their courses, but they don't necessarily know what that looks like. So basically, while there's a background conversation about how financially we have a problem coming in the next six to 12 months that is going to be fairly dramatic, um, in the short term, most everybody has got their heads down and trying to figure out how we're going to get um, things like people to be able to get grades so that they can apply to master's programs. And, and that's sort of, that, that's what's got most of us working right now. Yeah, so I'll, I'll provide uh, the news that many people are encountering is heavily out of the U.S. environment. And we want to try and broaden that a little bit to the degree that we're possible because higher education is a globally connected system. So as I may have whined to you on a separate occasion, Dave, I was currently supposed to be in Germany for the Learning Analytics Conference, which is now shifted 100% online. I had a little loop because it's a direct flight from Dallas to Frankfurt through Australia. And so I ended up, uh, I had an event out in Australia, so I was going to be here for about a week and then off to Germany. And unfortunately, in that cycle, after I got all the necessary approvals uh, to get my permission to travel from the university, uh, I, I ended up now spending some quality time in Australia, which is delightful and the weather is quite nice. However, the news here is around higher education is pretty dire. So I read last week, University of Sydney, for example, is facing a $200 million budget shortfall this year. And that budget shortfall is due to uh, obviously the huge percentage of international students. They rely very heavily on the international student population. The same holds true for any of what's typically called the group of eight in Australia. These are the big universities that are research intensive. They're all facing sort of massive uh, hiring freezes, uh, capital investment freezes, and the list goes on. One of the things that's been a little interesting out here is how slow the Australian government has been to take the initiative that other countries have. They aren't moving on uh, online as quickly in terms of the general workforce. Universities have been sort of slow to, to move in this direction. Even now, there's no formal work at home policy established by universities. Unlike Canada, universities here are very central. Uh, funded. There is you know, local provincial or state level funding, but it's also uh, done so at a national level. And so many cases, individuals are still as of today going into the office, even though just this week, they've had a number of bars, restaurants and other public gatherings shut down. So it's been interesting watching how uncertain the response pace has been from different uh, government agencies just around what th that looks like. Europe has been a little more aggressive. I know Germany initially had an early approach where they were like, all right, we're just going to get a unified perspective together and the universities put forward, yeah, we're going to do status quo. And then suddenly there was a dramatic shift where I think one of the partner universities, and we know this because our learning analytics conference was happening out there. One of the universities said, nah, we're done, shut it down. And uh, then of course, when one closes, there's a cascading social effect where peer yeah. institutions are, well, first of all, you screwed us over, but secondly, we're also closing. So it's, it's interesting watching this unfold. Um, one of the points you mentioned that I want to dive into, and it's come up several times, I'm going to share a link for, for in, the, in the forum here or in the chat in just a second, is the move to assessment via something that looks more like pass fail or that yep. isn't yep. done on sort of a graded angle. What do you think of that? Uh, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential problems down the road. If you actually take out your assessment model. So there are all kinds of graduate programs that won't admit you with a P, right? So just straight out of the gates, there's some technical problems about making that kind of decision. Uh, and plus, again, you're throwing this at a group of faculty members who have an established syllabus, they have an established social contract with their students that suddenly is not gonna count anymore. And that creates a lot of tension, a lot of stress, a lot of back and forth. Um, I think that there are other models that are similar to that that are a lot better. I actually really love the model at my own institution where what we've done is said, uh, we've bent the regulations. You can now, if you've got more than 60% of your grade done, change your final evaluation to something that's a little lighter for you to get done. So move towards something that is more like a take home piece or um, an assignment stretched out over 48 hours to give that flexibility for the technology to fit in. But then you still end up with a number grade that is still what's expected going into so many of the programs on the other side. Because that's the issue, right? I mean, we may solve a problem for today, but that today problem, that today solution may end up with gigantic problems down the line. Like the last person I want to be right now is a person in an appeals office at a registrar's office. I can't imagine what appeals are going to look like. Right. I'm, I'm assuming they're just going to have people are just going to have to sign off on them en masse because they're going to be thousands at every institution. 
right? And to me, yeah. some good decisions right now are going to make a huge difference down the road. To any faculty, I say the same thing to every faculty member I talk to, which is, look, don't put yourself in a position where half, so if you are going to do an assessment that is only 50 minutes long and it's written, you're going to get an appeal and half of your students are going to appeal and you're going to spend the next five years doing paperwork. Like it's those things that concern me at the faculty level. Well, and that's another point Julie dropped in is there's also some implications in sort of NCAA eligibility. And from that end, there's uh, students who are, it's a conversation I had with a couple of students recently where it's like, well, the, the, the students who are especially hard charging, heavy achievers, the ones that, you know, become sad when they, they're, they drop below a 90 or below a, you know, a 4.0, they're the ones in some ways that there's a degree of punishment for some of them because suddenly it changes the landscape and, and you're applying for medicine and now all of a sudden you have a few, you know, you have a semester of pass fail grades and what does that mean and what does that look like? So I think you raised a good point, which is we have to be cautious that how we're solving the temporary problem doesn't create a much larger problem uh, six months down the road or even longer. I mean, I think that's because assessment's never been a strategic discussion inside higher ed. It's an individual discussion. So yeah. I do my assessment and then I have an imposed assessment model that's given to me by the institution, but there's not a discussion there, right? About how the decisions I make as a faculty member impact the broader structure. So we don't have the hooks to link into to sort of go, oh, let's return to this conversation we've been ongoing, but rather we're trying to stand up a discussion um, about assessment that literally we've never had as a field. Well, yeah, and, and I think it's the, the difficulty here is you're, you're going to, it's going to be hard to change an entire field in a crisis mode, meaning you're not going to go out and is assessment a fundamental problem and has it been one for a long time? Absolutely. Is the model that we grade and evaluate our students incomplete, inaccurate, and not really a reflection of what should have happened? Of course. You look at a couple little projects, the private universe one that I frequently cite, which is uh, out of a group of students graduating at Harvard, Annenberg Media had this out as a, as a resource for, and still is, if you search private universe uh, from, uh, from Annenberg, you'll, you'll see the recording. And it's like students graduating university had not learned, in this case, Harvard, top university in the world, top students uh, graduating a four-year program and couldn't understand or explain why we have seasons. They did something comparable where they took a group of students at MIT and they gave them a bulb, a wire, and a battery, and they said, make this bulb light. And so here you got top engineering students graduating, and they don't have sort of simple concept mastery. And part of the reason is students learn to jump through assessment hoops without necessarily understanding the core concepts that we think they should know, such as the reason for seasons being the tilt of the axis, not the proximity of the sun. Um, I'm going to shift gears. The whole thing just setting you up so you could tell us how seasons work. Was that what that was? I wanted you to know because we're entering Aww. the the, uh, the joyful spring season in the northern hemisphere, and it's getting cold in the south. I, uh, I appreciate you doing that a little for bit, us, uh, Dave. To talk about study abroad students, there are a number of students that are caught in all kinds of really terrible situations. There's individuals that were doing whatever, academic work, research work in, in different parts of the world. There are students that had just launched at least in the Northern Hemisphere area that might be in the middle of a study abroad term. I have a niece that right now, she wasn't studying, but she was doing, you know, she's working as an au pair in Italy and uh, she is now in Italy for the foreseeable future. Yep. Governments aren't necessarily able to pull people back, especially when air travel and everything else is restrict, uh, restricted as it is, as it is. But, I mean, this is another one of those examples that's really prominent. We're creating problems that future Dave is going to have to solve. Yeah, and I mean, the international piece, both for study abroad and for the international students here, you know, the, the conversation about closing residences is the one that always comes to mind for me. So you can close a residence and the idea that a lot of people locally would have is, oh, they're gonna go home to their parents' house. Well, it's not the reality for an awful lot of our students in this case. So. Uh, you know, there are some institutions, again, I keep bragging about mine, but mine that said, we're keeping the residences open and we're going to deal because there's no place for these people to go. Uh, and if people can go home, they've been encouraged to, but they're keeping, they're standing that up and keeping it. But a lot of places they aren't. And it'd be the same abroad, right? So if you're in a study abroad context, you're living an extra part of the life for those people. And when they pare down to what they need to get done, those study abroad kids are going to be at risk. Um, 
and there's really nothing we can do about it, right? I don't know how we're going to, um, we're not, like you say, we're not gonna be able to bring those kids home, but I don't even know how we're gonna deal with all of their lost learning situations. Because again, that same appeals person, that one person who works in the registrar's office, who's responsible for appeals, all that stuff is going through that person. It makes you um, wonder too, like, you know, so there's a lot, at some point, do you just say, look, burn it. This semester is done. Everybody gets set. I mean, we're not going to because the amount of tuition dollars that are at play and there's actually real implications for, for students. I mean, some may prefer a pass fail or otherwise. So at some level, the question needs to be, what is the minimum we can do in order to have the maximum impact? And that's a big focus that we have in this sort of with this course as a whole, which is the bare minimum that you need to know as a teacher to begin to meaningfully support your students. But it's not just students and it's not just teachers. There was an article I'm just dropping into the chat now on the uh, Chronicle. So one of the things with the Chronicle is many of these universities end up having, uh, well, all universities have a broad swath of support staff. And something that most people listening to this are probably aware, universities have not done a great job of being institutions of public interest. They become heavily focused on becoming businesses, if you will. And that results in, we've had that decrease in employment uh, permanence, if you will, or we've had a decrease in a, a general approach to supporting the most vulnerable. And instead we've become much more commercialized, much more business-like. And this is just one example. We don't necessarily take care of the most vulnerable. We've shifted heavily to adjunct performance. We're making decisions based on dollars and cents rather than social societal obligation. And that's going to be more pronounced. So right now, there the article I just dropped in coming out of the Chronicle, which looked at how people are impacted from a support staff perspective, because it's not just us. And in the case, it's many students that are at that level where they're doing work on campus to partly support their ongoing studies or just living things like eating and stuff like eating that. Yeah. yeah no eating is a good example uh, and also paying for the internet access that allows them to do the online exams that have just been stood up right so there's a whole bunch of sort of integrated problems here where um you know we've got all those students who are now not working some of them are being paid at some place and some of them aren't but now we're expecting them to have all these devices and proficiencies that are going to allow them to be able to perform and i mean that's for the next three weeks here. I mean, I can speak for Canada. I'm going to speak for all of Canada. No, I can speak for the Canadian context. Um, that's for the next three weeks. But all of those issues that you just mentioned, uh, you know, May 18th starts the summer term. And then September 1st is really not that far away from a planning standpoint. So all of those people whose lives are being impacted, all of that planning that needs to happen, like what we're trying to do now is both do our emergency planning, but also planning for a potential September that's going to be entirely online, right? And then, you know, I was talking to a sculpting prof the other day in our uh, faculty, in our, in our arts faculty, and he's not sure that he's going to be able to do sculpting online, right? Like there are some things that are just, they're simply not going to work. You know, you can't weld together a car in your engineering program on the internet. And so there's all those issues as well, right? Interesting from a creativity end, uh, you know, obviously we are now um, fairly structured. Our thinking is confined to the experiences that we've largely had. And I remember in uh, early 2000 with a colleague, Stephen Yerkew, who I, who I know you know, and, uh, you know, we would, we had a number of interactions uh, and we ended up developing a course that specifically focused on hairdressing online. And yeah. so that's the kind of outcome that I think is unique and has an uneven impact. That, that you, you don't know what you need to do until you need to do it. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, wait a second. I didn't know we could do this and we can. And so maybe uh, you're gonna have a lot of cars being built in the garages of uh, students. Okay, okay Captain Innovation, let's take, the, uh, let's take the question from the chat room here. So another thing I'm struggling with is how to credit students for internship work for a grade when their internships have been canceled. Innovate me out of this one. Yeah, you know, great question. I think one example I've heard, so in Australia, you're a, there's people graduating now at the end of their education term, their, their final year of their education degree. They're not supposed to go out into industry or, well, industry is the wrong word. They're supposed to get, uh, they're supposed to be teachers starting their fall out here. And they're not, they are doing a practicum or a co-op term and they're not able to get uh, to go out because their, their uh, practicum is 
not working because schools are increasingly getting into shutdown mode. What happens to these students? I think at some level, we have to get a little bit flexible on it, which is you're going to have to say, look, we're going to give you a degree provisional on you completing your assessment and or your practicum, which means you get a degree contingent on a six months down the road evaluation, meaning you can get a job, you can get into the labor market, you've been with the university for years, you know the student already, and then you move into that direction. But I, I don't know how else you can start to do some of this without saying rethink all the rules that we have around how and what we should do online. Yeah, it's been, I've been, We've both been in higher ed for 20 years or so. 20. We started about the same time, I think, when you moved into higher ed. Um, I really don't think in all the time I've done change management and all the rest of the stuff, have I realized just how many rules we have and how intersecting and interconnecting they are, right? It's all of a sudden when you start pulling the string, the whole thing starts to unravel. And I mean, that unraveling, I think, has already been happening. And, and sort of somebody said in the chat room, you know, didn't see the bigger picture of this coming. I don't think that's only the pandemic. I mean, nobody saw the pandemic. Well, like four people saw the pandemic coming, but there's been an unraveling that's been going on for a while now, right? And people have been talking about it in a variety of different ways. We had the, we're only gonna have 10 universities in 20 years, which of course is not true, uh, but we've had people seeing what that challenge is, which is the shift that our culture is going through and our universities are sitting in the middle of it. And suddenly we're being forced to address questions that we've had dragging around for a while right? Like we've been trying to fill the gap on doing online multiple choice assessments for 20 years now. And we've all kind of come to terms with the fact that it doesn't really work. Um, but we've been kind of putting it off. And now suddenly, well, we're going to have to come up with a solution, right? Yeah. Because suddenly yeah. it's become way more important. Well, yeah, I agree. And, and I'm going to make another shift here to, to think a little bit about how academic communities as a whole are responding. Like we've talked students, we've talked uh, some of the focuses about faculty and some of the institutional aspects. Some of the stuff is granular, like literally, how do you do a video and upload to YouTube? Some of the questions yeah. people face are uh, at a systems level, like how does my academic domain succeed and grow or do we just pause research? for a year and, and don't just share and disseminate. So I just shared a, an email that in the link that uh, or in the chat area that looked at how AERA, the American Educational Research Association uh, announced that they're literally just gonna say, you know what, screw it. Initially they wanted to go online. They were saying, we're gonna take our conference online. But as you know, going online is not a just, oh, click a button and now talk to camera. Sure isn't. <laughs> One of the things, so for example, I'll drop a link into the learning analytics research community in just a little bit, but the, we had a group of people that have been, you know, the current program chairs that have been busting their butt trying to get their conference online. They've been moving toward it for a period of probably, I don't know, I guess uh, a month, month and a half since things, they, they slowly started getting in that direction. The infrastructure that you need, the planning that you need, how you have to change your program, because this is, this is uh, you know, stored in the ACM proceedings. So for many faculty, having this as on their, you know, something on their CV is important. Having a presentation and a workshop is important. And so you need this research in the public discourse or in the academic discourse. So interesting to see that in this instance, AERA basically said, nah, we tried to go online, but we aren't able to. So question for you, do you think that this is an issue about academic communities being prepared to take this on? Or do you think this is just literally one of those black swan moments where all bets are off? We, there's no lessons to learn from this. Or is there something here about saying you have a highly technical community that's able to shift and run a conference online, then you have a research community more like the ARA that isn't able to pull their stuff online for a variety of reasons. It may be because they don't have the, the technical capabilities. It may be because they just don't think that's where the academic community needs to be right now. They should be focused on helping others. But what's your take on this? I, I think, first of all, I'd say that there's almost no relationship between what a face-to-face -face event is and an online event is. I, I think they're fundamentally different things. And the event has a, the event space has a huge impact on what that actually is. So um, people go to massive sort of generalized conferences, mostly to see the other people who go to those massive generalized conferences. Yes, it's important that people get their papers in and that kind of thing, but the, the actual event of going has a lot to do with the eventedness of the space. 
um, the Lack community is a much more tight knit group. There are people who know each other who are going to be who are going to be trading their experience with a very specific focused group that they're going to be able to interact with back and forth. So I think that I can imagine that community probably spends a lot of time already interacting with itself in a variety of Slack channels and whatever where they're already working together now. So I think that that group's easier to stand up because it's more specialized. Um, but I think there's going to be, you're going to see an awful lot of things actually drop off because, and you're going to see people expect uh, people to come to conferences, online conferences, and those people just aren't going to come. Because right now, if you wanted to find, um, if you took almost any keynote who's at any conference, you could go and watch their video now. You don't have to wait for the conference to come out. That stuff already exists. It's the eventedness that matters. So I think that that distinction is the one that, that comes into play here. I just want to go back to something else Julie said in the chat room before you uh, move us forward. And that's about the difference between like why we can't go out and do online learning um, to help plan for K-12 classrooms um, and help as a teacher training prospect, why teacher trainers inside of higher ed can't go out and help ha have this happen inside a K-12 system. Um, at least in the K-12 systems I've worked with, and that used to be, that has a previous job, I used to do strategy, uh, ed tech strategy for K-12. Um, the system's totally not ready for it. The mentors are just not in place to be able to help those students along in terms of how they're going to be able to do it, uh, how they're gonna be training, how they're going to do that online learning process. Those things aren't in place. And frankly, they're not in place in a lot of faculties of education either, right? So if you look at a faculty of education, a lot of the people who teach in there were in the classroom 20, 25 years ago. Um, and so their understanding of the technical realities, like the pure technical realities of a classroom, aren't necessarily in a position where they can give the mentorship required for those teachers to be able to do this from their basements with no existing connection to the teacher community inside of their local community. So I think it'd be a real struggle. I would love to see people try to stand up like a province-wide or a nationwide strategy where you're trying to build resources non-specifically um, for high schools. Uh, but I think you'd find that that would be very challenging. Uh, it'd be fun to try though. Well, yeah, and, and uh, I think at a certain point when you're in crisis mode, the key issue is to do the best you can with the resources you have. Not everything Absolutely. gets treated equally and not everything is idealistic. So uh, meaning that sometimes you make sacrifices. Yes, it would be better if we graded people according to their skill sets and their actual capabilities, but we're gonna go pass fail because that's the only way people stay sane. Yes, a well-designed online course requires alignment between your initial uh, outcomes and your teaching practices and your assessment. However, right now I just found out how an email listserv works. So guess what? That's what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, on, on that note, I think we're going to wrap up here, Dave. We want to For keep sure. these reasonably short with a quick run through random information and uh, news and things like that. If any of you are on social media or have articles that you might want to share that are interesting to you, just use the pivot online hashtag on social media, or you can throw uh, Dave or myself an email. I'll just drop my email in here if anyone's randomly bored. Other than that, we will see maybe some of you uh, on Thursday. So take care, Dave. Good to chat. Thanks. Take all care, George. Time. We'll see you later, everybody.